All right, Ingram Smith, Bud Elliott back again for another episode of the Nolcast. Happens to be a 7 0 episode of the Nolcast, which is uh, definitely where you want to be after seven games. And we want to be at a place where we can thank our sponsors, Louisiana Hot Sauce. Bud is work, rocking the retro shirt this morning. And the great people at Congruity. CongruityHR.com is the website. Matt Lewis is the man. Uh, Congruity is the company that you want to work with. If you're interested in optimizing your business in by whatever means possible, Matt's been great to us and Matt's been great for us. And uh, we are very confident that you would have a similar experience. So congruityhr.com is the website. Congruityhr.com backslash Knowles is the FSU specific website. And as always, you're welcome to reach out to me if you'd like a third party intro. But let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do that, man. Also want to do a quick recap on the prize picks because we went sicko mode and we hit just full on Travis Scott here. Uh, prize picks would like to send me notifications. I'll allow notifications. Those winners that I hit this weekend. Yes. I, I'd like to be reminded of that. That, that. that is factual. So we went more than passing yards on both the Iowa and Minnesota quarterback. I said, look, just that this, this projection is sort of abnormally distributed, if you will. And we need to take advantage of that. So we went more than hit a nice little little two spot there from the Thursday show. And I believe the one that we sent out on Twitter also uh, also won barely. So I don't want to mis- re- misrepresent. That was uh, that was tough. Yeah, the, the one we sent out on Twitter was uh, yeah, so we we barely missed on uh, on Trey Benson and Harrison Wallace from um, from Penn State, but got the Isaiah Williams, got the Thomas Castellanos, got the Bo Nix, and got the Ethan Kaliak Manis. So, uh, yeah, man, it, it's always fun to play some prize picks and get some enjoyment. By the way, you're going to need some prize picks this weekend because there are not a lot of great games across this college ball slate. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of decent ones, but there's not a lot of great ones. Um, preseason top 15 teams. So, from the AP poll, the, the original one. 77 and one when they are favored by 10 or more points. Hmm. God. I mean, that's that's just wild, right? Like, I think that's why we have so much late season drama here. You know, it, it's it's pretty wild. Um, Florida State is one of those teams. Florida State is undefeated. They're getting it done, man. Like, I think we went what I went, I went 34-13. Duke scored 20. Seven of it was a defensive score. So they, you know, they hit the 13. Um, I thought this was a pretty good defensive effort overall, to be honest. Um, the idea that you would have lost if Riley Leonard stays in the game, I personally think is silly. Mm-hmm. Would the game have been closer? Yeah, you probably don't don't really pile it on and blow him out uh, if, if he stays in there. But there was also sort of like an exploratory period I thought in in the opening of this game because you're like, wow, okay, they're playing this kid. Interesting. Off what was a pretty serious ankle injury. It looked like, at, le- at least on the field. How well is he going to be able to throw and push off? How well is he able to move around? It turns out like on a straight line basis, he looked okay. On a moving laterally basis, not so much. Protecting himself basis, eh, I don't know. Um he had one scramble on the night and on a throwing basis didn't look great. Honestly, he's a savvy guy. I think he was probably making more checks at the line of scrimmage that the other kid could make for sure. Mm-hmm. But there was a bit of a feeling out period there. And I I thought Mike showed tremendous faith and trust in his defense in going for some of those early fourth down calls. Right? That, hey, we, we like your ability to get stops down here in the red zone, especially in the low red zone. Like that's, that's showing good faith in them. I, I don't know. I've got a lot of thoughts on this game. Got a lot of thoughts on, on the landscape as a whole, the remaining schedule, sort of where this team is. What, uh, what do you want to start with? Cause I, I listened to the incident. I thought you did a great job. I appreciate that, bud. Yeah. Um, I still, I still have some, some mixed thoughts on this game. Haven't gone back and, and watched it again. Um, Let's start on let's start on defense for Florida State. Uh, continue the conversation about 
Leonard and uh, some of the other things that, that they did. I also agree with you. I mean, it's easy to just look at a stat line, but it wasn't like Leonard was, uh, you know, 13 of 16 for 210 yards or something like that. Uh, the, the offense had a little bit of success in the opening drive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, kicked a, kicked a field goal when it was available there, got a pick six, kicked another field goal. That was the offense. You know, you, you weren't getting shredded uh, by any means. And uh, at the same time, I agree with you. When a team loses its quarterback, it's a big deal and tends to have some kind of outcome on the result. So I uh, don't want to be totally dismissive of it. And do just want to reiterate what we said before the game because we said it before the game, and I still think it's true, and I think it's more true – after having watched it. It's in the Duke podcast. I'm not a last name uh, gentleman with last name Elko, whatever. I would have never played that kid that game. Uh, you just I totally agree after watching. You, you don't need him uh, for that game. I don't think you were ever going to beat Florida State. Um, at least, you know, if you play Florida State with that team 100 times, you might beat them 15, maybe 10. I don't know. Um, I would have kept him. Duke is a good team. The ACC in the last two weeks has turned into bonkers land with some of the losses that we've seen. Uh, you got a very good chance to make the ACC championship game nonetheless. And I think that your chances would be even better if your quarterback didn't get hit and tackled a lot on Saturday night in a game that I'm not sure you were ever going to win. Yeah. Okay. So the fact that they played him, and I'm not going to accuse Duke of like putting this kid at jeopardy because I don't know what the medicals are, and that would be irresponsible. I do know that he got hurt again in the game. Mm. So, you know, and that everybody's at risk of getting hurt all the time, right? Johnny Wilson came back and got hurt again. So it, it, it's irresponsible to say stuff like that. In terms of having a really nice season, though, yes, beating FSU would be a huge capper on the season for Duke. But Duke still has a lot of important games left. This is why – this is one of the reasons why I really didn't think they would play him because I didn't think they would play him unless he was much closer to 100% than he looked. And he looked far from 100%. Um, doesn't it say something about what they think of the backup that they ran Leonard out there? I, I think yeah, that's it, probably the, like the commentary is, okay, if we play the backup the whole game – Bud and Graham are going to look like idiots for saying 34-13 because it would have been, you know, 48-3. Mm -hmm. Like the backup just at this point can't play. Yeah. Um, so maybe they didn't want that sort of embarrassment on national television. I I don't know. But you have Louisville coming up at Louisville this weekend. And you have a short rest week at Wake. Yeah. That's you're gonna need him to run in both of those most likely. Going to be a uh, if if we're we're second guessing this morning because we first guessed before the game. Uh, if you don't go and beat Louisville, th then this conversation will be all the more magnified, and and questions surrounding that will be significant. Now the the backup quarterback is limited. I mean, you could tell even in in warm ups. Uh, and I watched warm-ups more closely than I have for another team in a long time, just because you're trying to get a feel for what what Leonard looked like. Uh, he's just not there. Just not there. Not ready to play. Um, doesn't have some of the decision-making, which is not something you can evaluate in warm-ups, but just doesn't have quite the arm talent that, that you're looking for for a starting quarterback at this point in time. Um, yeah, Duke's good. Duke is solid. Duke's kids play hard. Um, I, I certainly understand the the idea that you don't just want to get thumped on national TV, but I like Duke's chances a lot more playing in Charlotte in December than I do in Duke Campbell in October. Uh, I, I still would have said, fine, you get us here. We're playing for the rematch. And if we beat you 10 or 15 times out of 100 here, yeah, maybe we beat you 25 times out of 100 in Charlotte at a neutral site game in, in December. So, um, Elko is an infinitely smarter man when it comes to football than I am. I'm not trying to sound like a know it all, but I would have, would have never played this kid at all and would have just saved him and said, We hope to see you in December. So, yep, agreed on that. So, with that framework, um, defensively, I thought it was a, a good effort overall. Uh, you know, you, you hold Duke to 273. 
on 57 plays. That's you know four point into play. I I would give the defensive effort like I don't know a a B. I guess right. Like a, I mean, I think in order to get an A, you would pl- playing with 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 a full throated crowd in Doak. I, I'd I'd want to see something you know closer to like 225 yards against against that Duke outfit. You know maybe. On the on the low four point something or high three point something yards per play allowed, mm-hmm. uh, but where, where were you on YPP again? Uh, four point eight. Four point eight. Okay. So, um, yeah, I I would say probably like 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 a B effort for, for, for the defense. I have mixed thoughts on on how it played out. So, on the one hand, I thought you got out coached a little bit in ter- terms of some of the run game stuff, but also just outplayed at times. Right? It, it is. It is a bit concerning for future projections. Like this is another data point we're going to put up here. And we're going to say, okay, they're able to run the ball on you some in terms of staying ahead of the chains with the run game. They're a very diverse run game. We covered that in the preview. They did a nice job scheming you on some stuff. They got some good angles. On the other hand, I really do think that, first of all, you did a great job of limiting explosive pass plays. Duke basically had nothing. Four of their six explosive plays, I thought, were almost like direct results of uncalled holding. Yeah. And I'm not trying to, like, bitch about holding here. And I got some crap on Twitter for this yesterday. But I've covered this league for 20 years now. Right, well, covered it, no, more, more like 15. There is a certain level of holding that if you are one of the lower-end schools – and I've talked to defensive coaches at other schools. They, they, they know this, or at least they think they know. So I'm just passing on their opinion. But like the schools that recruit the really big time defensive linemen, they're going to get held. Mm-hmm. So, so that's FSU, Clemson, and Miami. And to a certain extent, NC State. Like if when when they're playing like the Wakes and the Dukes and occasionally like, like a Cuse or a BC. They're going to get away with more because the the refs are not going to call 10 holding penalties mm-hmm. on these teams. You just have a different level of athlete oftentimes than they do. You know it. I know it. Everybody sees the recruiting rankings. They know it. But they really did do a good job of popping explosive runs on plays that they held. Like They, 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 they paired that up nicely. They, they, they made the most of it, I thought. Um, at the same time, Go back to listen to the Syracuse review. Graham and I both complained about tackling, man. And tackling in this game was an issue again, both in terms of if you're in position, you got to get the guy down, and also being in position to make the tackle. Tackling two weeks in a row is is a, is a bit of concern of mine now. I, I, I don't I don't know why this is. I don't I don't think this team was a really a bad tackling team through the first month, but. I don't know. Like, why, why do you think that, like, they're, that they're not getting guys on the ground? It, it, it seems to be, that, that seems weird to me. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, not not to not to go super macro, but tackling in general has has been on a steep decline in football for the past fifteen or twenty years, and and for some extent, I think it's probably the same reason here. I mean, I haven't been to practice, uh, but. I think it's maybe a little bit more restricted as to who you're tackling throughout the week to week uh just process of uh moving forward and also you know you're you're seven games into a season i think i don't know that anybody's playing with like a, a major injury but a lot of people are playing with knocks uh a lot of shoulder injuries stuff like that things that can are shoulder bangs i don't know if they should say shoulder yeah. injuries but you know, things that can limit your ability to wrap up. And I think you're seeing that in a little bit of some of your players. It's nothing that you don't pick up through throughout the course of a, a season, but some of the areas where you don't have maybe quite as much rotation and depth as you'd like, I think you're seeing a little bit of wear and tear on, on those units. I, I think that's fair. Um, Cypress was an interesting player in this game. Mm-hmm. Cypress run defense gets somewhere between like a D and an F. Uh, it, it just bad angles, got a tackle, but not 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 playing winning football mm-hmm. from the corner position. 
I, I'm not expecting you to be an amazing run defender, but you got to give me better than that. Cypress pass defense. I thought he was all over the guys. I thought it was his best game. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. It was. Uh, that's interesting. Ventrell's a super strong, smart guy who uh, maybe you know. I don't know. It, we all measure athletes differently and stuff like that, but just from a raw athletic perspective, Ventrell may be like top three or four athlete on the team. The guy yeah. squats more weight than you'd ever expect for somebody from that position. Uh, super fast, smart kid. Uh, you know, I don't know the kid. I'm not like best friends with him or whatever, but very s- sharp, mature kid who who takes football very seriously. Um, I was surprised to see him struggle as much as he did in aspects of the game on Saturday. And also was enthused, thought, thought he's, uh, you know, again, I'll just reiterate what I said, thought it was his best game that he's played in Garnet and Gold as his past defender. Um, so, Got to, got to get a little bit more consistency and continue to develop the the, uh, the past defense if you're if you're Fintrell. But yeah, a game of uh, two two polar opposites. So, you know, linebacker. I I, I thought honestly that your your starters, Bethune and 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 uh, and, and Deloach were were fine. Um, they did pick on Graham some. I know we've had a lot of questions in the chat, like, hey, what do you think about all these rotations? Uh, yeah, Robert asked, so what, what do you think about playing so many different players significant snaps? How has this affected the snap count draft? My God, we probably need to take a look at that, uh, actually. it's. Uh, I have a feeling that anybody that took like a defensive lineman with a massive snap count other than verse is probably going to be probably over-projected. Uh, there is a, a level of rotation. And look, Odell is always going to rotate his guys, but uh, almost hyper-rotation this year. And it appears to be working. Also... It's a testament to guys like Malcolm Ray who have developed a, a, a need to be on the field. So, so you're they, they they cycle through defense alignment definitely, and, and they put kids out there and at times that maybe make you double you know do a double take, but it's where you are, and uh, kids have earned playing time. So you're just playing well. Uh, well, to, to the defensive line point and the rotation point, like. They, they kind of picked on Omar Graham a little bit. He's he got they, they when 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 he was in there, Duke knew it. Mm. I'll, I'll say that. So you're starting backers, but you need to just keep playing these backups too, because you need those starting backers good and healthy. And you and, and I, I think they are very conscious of this. I, I think there is a bit of a load management type thing here, and I think they knew they were going to beat Duke, and that they wanted to stay fresh for the fourth quarter. And you want to get guys in early. And Adam Fuller talked about this yesterday in the press conference. He's like, "Hey, we we do want our guys in for for critical situations, our 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 studs in for critical situations, which you know make makes some sense." Defensive line rotation. It is nice to have like when somebody doesn't have a good game, you can have somebody else kind of kind of show up. So, like Farmer did not make himself any money on Saturday, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I know after the last two games against some really bad offenses, people were like, "Oh, Farmer," you know, like he's going pro type stuff it, scouts were there for this one I, I don't i don't think he made himself a lot of money fisco fist picked up the slack that was that's the guy that i think we thought we might get early mm-hmm. in the year just the, the 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 burst the effort the relentlessness that man that is so nice to have and fabo love yeah. it gave you what 20 he couldn't have played 50 snaps it was probably like 20 or 30 snaps high effort you know, in, in intense snaps when you need them. That's that's what we talked about. It's what you want. Yeah, Fambo starting to look like like a guy that uh, that you remember starting to literally just throw throw not shedding blockers, throwing blockers. Uh, I think he had two tackles for loss. Was another disruptive force on another two or three plays. Uh, I thought Fabian Lovett played his best game of the year on Saturday. It, exactly. Um, Jared Verse got <clears throat> got held like crazy on two plays. I thought he did a poor job on two others, and I thought he had two really nice, pretty key stops. So, mm-hmm. bit of a mixed bag. We probably think of his play differently, you know, if if he doesn't get grabbed, kind of bear hug <laughs> twice. Uh, overall, decent defensive effort. Um, 
look, I'm not going to go nuts about the defense because this is three straight games that you have played either hurt or backup quarterbacks. You got the same thing last year, right? I'm not forgetting some of the efforts you had early in the season. However, I will continue to point out, yeah, like should LSU have scored 24-ish? Sure. Even if they did, hypothetically. 24 against LSU before garbage time, if that's what you had allowed. Yeah, that's that's what the yardage that LSU gains suggests you probably should. That's still a hell of a defensive effort, man, on a neutral site against this LSU offense. Like LSU is putting up insane yeah. points on everybody. Like that's yeah. that's the best offense in the country. And you held them to 17 on the scoreboard and probably on an expected points basis, like 24-ish. Very possibly your Heisman winner at this point as well. And the Heisman's been insane this year. Uh, no one has absolutely stepped up and, and tried to grab it. In fact, it, it at times appears otherwise. But, uh, yeah, I think Daniels, if it was today, I think Daniels would be the kid in, at the New York Athletic Club holding up a, a trophy that is uh, deceptively heavy, but have you ever picked that thing up? It's about feels about like it's not. a 45-pound plate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's solid. I mean, not that you would think it's a – you know, shell of itself, but uh, it's a great trophy. Great trophy. I like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Daniels is like, there's kind of three guys for the Heisman race right now that are really high up. And then there's a, a, a couple, there's a secondary group. Um, McCarthy plus 240, Penix plus 320, Daniels plus 340. So, like, we're kind of all mm -hmm. roughly the same. Okay. Um, McCarthy, by the way, one of the major questions I had with him was like, how would he look in a dropback standpoint as opposed to play action? Because last year he was number one in the country in play action passer rating, but he was like 50th without play action. This year he's number one. So, like, you know, former five star quarterback for Michigan now looks like he's figured it out. And that's pretty scary. Like, I, I, despite all the sign stealing stuff, I do have Michigan as my number one team, like like by a point over Georgia. Uh, but there's a lot of guys still a lot like Jordan. I know this sounds crazy. Jordan's fifth in the Heisman odds. Florida State is now favored to go undefeated, very slightly, but it's like fifty two percent now in Vegas. Whereas like two weeks ago they were like you know forty percent. If you get a couple oh, guys mess no, around, the Miami game, uh, we can in in time. Let's uh, go look at what Clemson ran for in that game, and I think you can start to see where where the concerns will stem from. Uh, Miami's going to be a real ass test, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, exactly. Like you're you're a very good team. You're not a great team. I I, th I think is 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 pretty fair to say, and you're a hell of a lot better than you were. In 2020, 2021, and I think you're decidedly better than you were in 22. Like, the team is improving every single year. But, yeah, there are real tests real tests left for sure. Let's talk a little offense. Before we do, though, I want to talk something legendary. Legendary home loans. 844-FSU-LOAN, 844-FSU-LOAN. I don't know if we had have uh, Chad in the chat today, but Chad and Shannon do a tremendous job, uh, honestly. And, and I mean, I, I've used them twice. I think they, they just – look, knowledge of the industry – Customer service, best possible rates they can get you, personal experience. 500 Dolcast listeners have done so. I mean, like every email we get, it's like, man, I love these guys. They, they they did me right. It was great to work with. You know, for you might think like for the mortgage team, it's just another mortgage, right? And of course, the the stats say sure. But like for you, that's a pretty important purchase. It's going to be your, your, your biggest expense of each month. So you want to make sure you get it right, and uh, they, they try to make the process uh, as you know, stress-free as possible for you. So 844-FSU-LOAN is the number to call. You want to talk offense? Let's talk offense, man. Absolutely. Um, interested to uh, to know what you, what you thought you saw out there and um, what you make of the final 15 minutes. So, I, I don't know that the first, like, three quarters were quite as bad as as they seemed. And then, like, the, the, the floodgates kind of opened there in the, la in the last, you know, part. I, I just have high confidence that this football team under Norvell 
is going to roll out of bed and score 30 against basically every team they face that's not like an elite defensive line that can mess up your offensive line. And Duke has a good D-line. It's not elite. It doesn't have a bunch of guys who are like, oh, that's going to be a first-round pick type thing. You know, it, Clemson's defense is still really damn good, right? And you, you needed overtime, but, but but you did score 30-something up there. You just you, you, you have to have the feeling that they're just going to poke and prod, figure out what the opponent wants to do to them during the game, and eventually they're going to get in the end zone because Travis is a good quarterback. You have real weapons on the outside. You have a nice variety of backs. You have an offensive line that's clearly hurt, but they're rotating guys in and out. They're they're playing through stuff. And it's not like you didn't move it at all in the early going. You just you got stopped in critical situations. That's to me, that's just kind of variance, man. Like I, I never thought they were going to lose this game. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't like you were screwing up stuff that was really, really concerning early. You know, I, I I don't know, man. Like I just I didn't I wasn't that nervous about this because partially because I didn't think Duke was going to keep scoring on you. Um Travis's pick six was concerning, right? I I but it's not a departure from how he has played. We talked about this. He has more turnover worthy plays this year through the same number of games than he did last year. He just has been very lucky and it's luck in turnover avoidance because teams have dropped picks that he threw. This game, they caught one, so which was kind of unlucky with, with, with how it bounced up. Mm-hmm. You know, offensive line got worked a little bit. And I, I just think that is a that's a limitation on this team. We talked about this in the offseason. Yeah. How yeah. many of these guys do you think are going to play in the pros? <clears throat> Limited. Because it's yeah. and, and, and they, a lot of them have picked up injuries and uh, look you got uh they're clearly limited look at them i mean like we don't have to like hide it like i'm not gonna say like oh this guy's got this and this guy's got this but they don't move the same way as they did in, yeah in, in the first week like, they're clearly hurt yeah you don't have like just five monsters you know you've got eight players that are pretty good and you rotate them and you beat on people and you lean on people and uh I think that's just going to be the roadmap moving forward. I, I don't know that we're going to have a pure set starting five for this offensive line. I think you've got some complimentary talents. you got some guys that are, uh, you know, deserve snaps, work hard, better at run blocking, better at pass blocking, whatever, as you look at the individual pieces. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's a Rubik's Cube to use the uh, – metaphor that I've gone to throughout the year. There's there's not just a set of five that you're going to roll with as soon as you figure out exactly how all the uh, the pieces or, or colors, I guess, in that one need to align. Uh, just think you're going to roll with this. You're going to have a rotation. Maybe some guys see their snaps dropped a little bit. Some guys see their snaps increased. Um, I think this is just what you are. You know, you got eight guys who are good players, but you, you just – You know, um, I said in the instant that Saturday night for me was a another reality setter of of what this offense can be when it's great and Jordan is running, but also just ye. Um, The reference that I made to the Miami game three minutes ago. You know, you're you're going to struggle with defensive lines that are good, very good, or excellent, and uh, you're gonna have to go ahead and plan for that. You know, I would I would imagine that against Miami, probably going to need to spread the ball around a, a decent amount and try to uh, try to spread the ball all, all over the field, uh, not spread the ball a decent amount, meaning to different pieces, but literally have to spread the field and, and operate uh, as such. I don't, I'm not trying to gas Miami too too much, but dude, just watch them. Uh, you, you're going to have a hard time establishing a run game against Miami. So, Interested to see what the game plan is for that. And that's, you know, two games, three games away at this point. So not something we need to spend too much time on. Yeah. And like to, to the point here, uh, LA the God, uh, Bud, given how every other top 10 team outside of Michigan has struggled with inferior opponents and showed inconsistencies in offense, just like us. Do you still think this team can't win a natty? Yeah. I, I think it's really unlikely that they would actually host, like hoist the trophy at the end. And part of it's because of the offensive line. I think they would get wrecked 
in one of the two play. Like if they won, if they won the first playoff game, I think they probably get wrecked in the second. I just you need more pros. You need more special big bodies on this team. They've got a lot of experience. They don't have a lot of pro bodies. And the teams that win the titles have pro players on the lines of scrimmage. I don't know how many like more I, clearly I can say that. I think you're a very legitimate contender for the playoff, right? But there is a reason why where you are in the national championship odds has a clear separation from where you are in the make the playoff odds. I think like on a power rating standpoint, you could tell me this team is like somewhere between the third best and the 12th best team in the country because I think they're all jumbled very closely. And I think that's very fair. Like if they played Penn State tomorrow, I'd have FSU favored by like a point. If they played Oregon and Washington tomorrow, I'd have FSU favored by like a point. If they played Georgia or Michigan tomorrow, I would have FSU as an underdog of more than a touchdown because of the lines of scrimmage. Honestly, like I, I so yeah, I'm not trying to be a, a Debbie Downer there. And things happen. And maybe you have a game where, where Jordan and Keon just go absolutely insane. And it's very possible. I think you would need two of them if you're going to win a national title back to back under immense pressure because. Duke handled your offensive line largely, yeah. you know, and Mike can't coach around that in, in if you're getting wrecked up front. Like, he can do it against this, but it's, you know, it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah and look, I agree with I mean, you on Miami. But, like, Miami safeties did not get tested by Clemson. Carolina embarrassed those guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. There good is point. a different passing element to what you have than what Clemson has. Yeah. Uh, good point. Um. This isn't a Clemson podcast, bud. But so, like back in school, you remember where you'd have like things where you get in trouble, and then you'd have things that fall under the umbrella of direct disobedience. Um, yeah. I mean, I, th- I look. I thought Dabo kind of covered for him, and, and maybe there was an option at the Florida State play where the guy you know, throws it wide on third down or whatever, rather than give. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how you play that kid. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, bemoan too much. But, like, if you're literally just improvising as a quarterback and not running the play, uh, that is – it'll be very interesting to see how that works. I I think Clemson's a, in a – in a curious spot right now. Uh, and it's unfathomable to me that the quarterback is just, just freestyling uh, on some of the more important plays throughout the course of the year. So I understood what he saw, but like if he hands it off, it's a touchdown, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I understand what he saw, but you can't be looking, you know, like, does that make sense? Like I, I, I see what you saw, but if, if the call's a handoff, then you don't need to be trying to read anybody in to begin with. Uh, so that's uh that's an interesting situation. Very, very interesting situation. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It overall, I thought Jordan played pretty well in this game. Um Duke <sighs> really made a concerted effort to double key on. I think that's reflected. Like it, we 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 weren't we didn't even see him forcing the ball to key on, right? Like there's the one catch over the middle where Great throw, great catch, great decision. I, I, tough for me to say that, but hey, the result was cool. Um, yeah. But overall, like he didn't force the ball to Keon because Duke really did try to try to bracket Keon. Like they they played underneath and over top. You did see him go a lot to Johnny, which is something we talked about um, in, in in some of these ball games post LSU, right? Okay, teams are going to realize that Keon is that guy. Johnny's going to have a lot of one on one opportunities. It sucks he got hurt again, so. You, know, you you really need him back by the Miami game. If you get him back earlier, that's that's awesome. Uh, you know, I I think uh, you also could have used Hill in this game, right? Like being able to attack the middle of the field, you did a pretty nice job with with Bell, and that was that was key. Like you had to have guys there who could help you out over the middle because they, they were taking away the outside stuff and they were making you be patient and they were coming up and tackling pretty well. I, I thought this was a, a decent offensive effort. Um, I did like how they got Kazai Holmes 
involved down there in the low red zone mm. with that screen. I thought that was basically a pass that last week would have gone to Benson. And since Benson had three or four drops, they're like, okay, like, like the game is tight. We can't afford to have Benson dropping the football. Let's like Holmes, the big back with the head of speed. We like his ability to catch it. Here we go. And great. This team is playing like with good effort for each other. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really is like the blocking man from the receivers, especially in the second half, I thought was really pretty good. Dude. Jaheim Bell never blocked like this at South Carolina ever. Never. Ever, ever, ever. Like you give credit to whoever you want to there. That that's a different type of player. And uh <laughs> yeah. See that guy give Jordan the old wave in, like uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I got this dude. Come on. It's it's that, that wasn't the player you had in Columbia last year. That's that's a credit to Mike, credit to whoever you want to give there. It's a different player with a different type of mentality. Oh. So, and yeah. emblematic of what this, you know, if you're going to play, you know, block. And I think that does come directly from a head coach who was a wide receiver, who, you know, was not the, not a guy that's going to run a 4 3 and jump up and moss a bunch of people and just knows that you got to play with a level of effort at that position that doesn't matter if the ball's not coming to you on that play. Um, that's a, it's a, a solid development. Best three run blockers on the night. Keon, Johnny, mm-hmm. and Byers. Yeah. Yeah. Like Byers pass pro, certainly still a work in progress. Yeah. Byers run blocking the last two weeks is better. Yeah. I don't know that, that that's an opponent thing, but I I, I thought Byers, I thought Byers looked good. Um, certainly like not not getting exposed. And you needed it because it's very clear just watching their movement. Washington and Harris and Scott are limited right now. Mm-hmm. Like all, all three of those guys are limited. Like you needed buyers to come out and give you a solid game. Just, Hey man, can you give us 55 snaps? That is not going to hurt us. Mm-hmm. And I think on, on, on balance, he did that. And that, that was important because if he starts getting really jacked up and, and turned around confused a little bit and, and not playing with composure, like at times he did against Clemson, then you got problems. Yeah. Then you start to get worried about the ball game, but he didn't. Like he played well for relative to his recent, you know, quality of play. Um, let's see other stuff here. Let's go um, ahead and thank our friends at Charlie please. Park. Charlie Park, Tallahassee's best rooftop bar. Charlie Park really wanted to just Tallahassee's best culinary experiences in general. There's Really, I would put Charlie Park and then a Italian place that's uh, on the on uh, Monroe there as as uh, your two best places, or at least my two favorite places. Fantastic um, food and drink options, but just wonderful scenery, great people, um, everything that Matt Thompson and the For the Table Restaurant Group puts their name on is uh, fantastic. And hey, if you happen to be staying at the AC Hotel which uh, many people do when they come to Tallahassee. Got great news for you. It's about 40 yards outside the front door. So uh, if you're there, it's right there next to you. Charlie Park, a fantastic place, place we'd recommend reservations for. Even when I went up there uh, after the Syracuse game, it was more or less booked up. So uh, put the reservation in, go enjoy it. It's a fantastic place, and we thank them for their longstanding and unwavering support of the null cast. Do you know who did not give a solid effort in pass blocking? Who is that? Uh, the, the right side of Duke's offensive line. Mm. Like you might think FSU had some struggles in this game. At times they did. Yeah. Duke's offensive line was non-competitive in pass. Left, left guard had his hands full with 55 Ooh. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. They, they, He's and Peyton abused that right tackle. Mm-hmm. Like I hope he studies. Like Duke's a good degree, um, <laughs> because Peyton Peyton smoked him. Like that was mm-hmm. a night. That's what you need at at a Pat Peyton if if you're running major adverse getting held like crazy, <laughs> right? Like that's that's good. Fuller also talked about um, yesterday in the presser. Like your job is to fight through blocks, right? And and, and you know, if you are getting held, you got to sell it a little better than they did at times, which is true, right? So, 
I thought Jordan with the run game, they they use Jordan in a little more like variety of read stuff. They don't always break it out. Like in what games this year has Jordan not got dinged up somehow? Right. So I don't think that they really want him on as many designed runs mm-hmm. as you know, as maybe you'd like to see if, if you're trying to have him win by 50. But late in the game, like they Duke was not playing QB QB keep much at all, and they broke it out, right? Like they I also thought that while Duke did a good job of formationing the Knowles early for looks, the Knowles did a good job of formationing Duke late. Right, like so, some of these, some of these looks they gave, they clearly said, "Okay," and this is in-game coaching and adjustments. Okay, Duke, when, when we do this, Duke is generally aligning like this. We're getting this look like this. What can we run out of this look? And part of this is just paper, rock, scissors. Right, there, there is some randomness to play calling. You call this, they call that. Up in your booth, you're like, oh, we got this. Up in their booth, they're like, oh, shit. We, ooh, man. Like, do we take the time out? Can our kids mm-hmm. adjust this? Because that's kind of how it is sometimes, right? It, it, and I think a couple of those times, FSU almost certainly knew in the booth, oh, this is scoring. Just because of how, how Duke aligns, whether they tip the blitz or not. It, there's a couple things. You're like, okay, so we're plus one. <laughs> we're, we're, we're plus one here, plus two angles. This unless somebody really messes up, like you'd have to have a whiff for this play not to score. Um, Don't drop it, Bo. Yes, to, okay, exactly. To, to use a old, old cut, but yes, absolutely. That was 2010 yeah. up there? 10 or 9, but yeah, yeah. yeah. That had to be 2009 because it was, uh, that was the year the defense was just her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they thought they had to score fifty at UNC. Yes, um, that is a reference to a comment that your offensive coordinator makes, like as a ball snapped, uh, because he realizes that Bo Relaford is going to be wildly open on this play, and uh, I can't remember if that went for a touchdown or if it just went for forty yards or whatever. But it was. Uh, you, you knew what you were going to have, and you knew you are going to have an opportunity with your tight end, Bo Relford. So. Yeah, one, 100%. Um, and then you won that game 30 to 27. Mm. It was, uh, yeah, Christian Potter. That was some of my favorite, favorite Jimbo, uh, just knowing that he was going to have to score and uh, embracing it. And that was a, that was a different day, fun, fun times. Did 09 also have the UNC game, the comeback against UNC? What what year was that? Uh I think that was the I think that was the year later, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh so you know, Ponder uh Yeah, Ponder went for 395 in that ball game. That was mm-hmm. pretty solid. TJ Yates went uh went for 64 yards. It's kind of a weird box score there. Ponder went, I think he was either perfect in the second half or or maybe 16 to 17 or whatever. It was one of the best short, uh, you know, condensed performances that that you've seen from somebody. So you were down, anyway. uh, you were down 17 to six at the half. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rod Owens catches the, the 98 yarder. 99, 98 yarder from from Rod from old school. Yeah. Nice. They memories. ran for 238. You had some defensive ends that I'm not really sure would even be walk ons on this team uh, trying to. <laughs> Trying to play out there, that was a that was an interesting time. Um, man, it is yeah. So going forward with the offense, this would be a good time for Kentron Poitier to step up. If you get Hill back, this would be, you know, I, I this would be a good time to do that, right? Um, Bell more involved, I think, is important. You need continued improvement from Douglas. And I, I think that they are slowly figuring things out. I would be kind of surprised if Wake's quarterback plays this weekend. Like, Pitt was all over the backup. The backup really can't play. Like, Wake won that game, but Pitt lost that game with two egregious personal fouls late. And their quarterback, in a cruel, cruel twist of fate, because remember... Kenny Pickett did the fake slide mm-hmm. against Wake in the AC title game uh, on that explosive play. 
Uh, did you see how Pitt lost this game? I did not. No. Oh, dude, their quarterbacks. Uh, he's he's scrambling wide open first down to ice the game. They're just going to take knees because they're not crystal ball, and he starts his slide one yard short of the first mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. They have to punt. Personal foul. Personal foul. Wake's kid makes a throw. Pitt loses. Pitt is, I believe, out of bowl contention now. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if you're a quarterback and one of the few plays that you've got to go out there and give your body up and you slide a yard early, that's uh... – No, he could have just kept running. Right, yeah, yeah that's like what I'm saying. Slide, and you decide really. to slide and you decide to slide early and the fact that it gave an opportunity uh, – it's going to be tough for your teammates to look at you and maybe even tough for you to look at yourself in the mirror. But uh, our listeners, bud, will love looking at themselves in the mirror when they go to homefieldapparel.com. Uh, homefieldapparel.com, great partners of the Nolcast. I think I saw the bomber jacket three or four times while I was walking around Tallahassee on Saturday. We're starting to get the bomber jacket weather, by the way, which is lovely, lovely development. Uh, but no, home field, great clothes, vintage uh Wonderful, high-quality vintage options. Also have a couple more kind of contemporary pieces, uh, but things that I love to give to uh, friends and families of mine, uh, friends and family members of mine, and would suggest that you two would be impressed by the operation and the quality of uh, material that Homefield sends you. So again, homefieldapparel.com. You can go there, click the Florida State tab, use coupon code NOLCAST23, for what I believe is 15% off at checkout and a big thank you to our friends at home field. Fantastic there. Um, all right. A couple of things I was thinking about here and if I can find my notes. Oh, so <clears throat> FSU is going to play five straight games against hurt or backup quarterbacks, just like they did last year. I would expect that the rotations continue as far as playing a lot of guys because the final month you will play two teams that have real athletes on the line of scrimmage and will play physical. Like Miami, this will be their Super Bowl because they are not out of contention for the ACC, but they're pretty close still. Mm -hmm. Like they have to be perfect from here on out essentially because they already have two conference losses and UNC, which was unbelievable by the way to lose that UVA team. But uh, they have the tie break over Miami. And Florida in the swamp will play with their hair on fire because that will be their Super Bowl. There is some chance that that's the game Florida needs to be bowl eligible. I don't think that is likely because they should beat Arkansas in the swamp if they don't, uh, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. But if they happen to lose to Arkansas, Florida's stretch is interesting. They go Georgia, Arkansas, at LSU, at Missouri, at FSU. No, no, no bye weeks. But, yeah, the next two weeks, continue to get a lot of young guys in, continue to have a good plan, continue to try to get healthier, because I think you're going to need to be healthy if you're going to run the table here on this thing, which, mm-hmm. again, is very possible. And I do think you'll do it, but it's not it's not a layup, right? Um Got to get healthy. Got to keep having the young guys progress. Oh, I should mention. Hakeem Williams, good progression. Early on, blocking well. In that LSU game, blocking really well. Then he, you know, has a nice catch. Then he scores. When Johnny goes down, you saw who they went to. Yeah. Man, I was really high on Hakeem Williams' ceiling. I did not anticipate based on like he didn't show up in amazing shape to to school right and he was very raw coming out like his very, his very grade raw. was like as a projection i did not anticipate him playing this much early like he played meaningful snaps and played with good effort and caught the yeah. football like that's a very positive sign for this football team next year and yeah. maybe this year yeah great great development from hakeem love what you see from him love the effort that you, he's getting to you um, but I hate to do this, but there's like literally two people in the world that I would take a phone call at any time. Uh, I understand that. All right. I'll, 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 I'll lay in this thing. All right. We got Thank congruity. You, or we, we hit congruity off, off, off the jump. We did home field. Ad, ad reads are done. We're good. Ad, ad reads are done. Okay. So I want to, all right, everybody stick around. Um, 
we do have a couple of people asking some stuff about uh, recruiting, and we got some people asking some stuff about the fourth down calls. So, yeah, let's do both. Uh, okay, so on the fourth down calls, there is not an instance this year in any of the databases that I know about where a coach made an incorrect call to go for it in like a non-garbage time situation, okay? Coaches should be going for it more than they are. Mike Norvell consistently grades out as one of the best game managers out there. Over the course of several seasons, Mike's game management approach is going to be worth an extra win, okay? The amount of win probability he adds based on the decision, not, not the result, just based on the decision itself, consistently and how he manages games, is it's not like the pure play to the blackjack card optimal approach, but it's about as close as you're going to get out there in football. Yes, going for it on fourth and one at your own 36 is a clear go, okay? It's a leak in your game to punt that ball. It's more of a gamble to punt that ball. We need to flip the narrative here on how we address these terms because for 40 or 50 years, people don't understand you know, what, what the math is on this stuff. Now that they do, if you have a coach who gets it, it's an advantage for you. If you have a coach who doesn't get it, it's a disadvantage for you. Hello, Texas a and by the way. You know, um, the fact that you didn't get it is not reflective on the decision, right? You're going to miss some of those. It's okay. You have to understand what the value of each yard marker is. Fourth and one at your own 36 is a clear go. It, it just is. You need to value each possession. You need to start thinking in your brain like punting is a turnover. Now, maybe not a bad turnover, but still like, you know, there, there are turnovers and there are turnovers. But punting there is considered a turnover, right? You absolutely go for it. I, I, um, I, I also, I, I think it shows, no, there's not value in flipping the field. It, it's, it's not like the value, the point value in, in flipping the field there is, is not what you guys think it is. That's why these coaches are increasingly going for it. This is where the sport's going, by the way, like the sport right now is in the spot where remember like how bunting was in baseball in like the early 2000s. And like there are still some old school managers who bunted and increasingly the front offices who were filled with guys who were really smart and they, they had the models and like they understand the impact of the decisions. And increasingly they were like, hey man, if you want to coach for us, if we're spending $180 million to put together this roster, you cannot be screwing up our efforts with this insane bunting stuff and giving away win probability by giving away outs. That's essentially the way you need to start thinking about these fourth downs. I didn't think either of these calls were, were at all debatable, right? It, They're not. Now, if it's like fourth and five on your own 36, I might have a little more problem with that, right? And yes, people are like, oh, well, the computers and nerds and math and stuff. Yeah, I, I, Not a lot of dumb guys getting rich, right? That's that's what I'll say on that. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I, I I checked with with a guy that I know who runs one of the like the major analytics firm out there that, that all these schools uh, all these schools subscribe to. In their model, which I know Epic Shoes is uh, really similar. It's a clear go. So that's that's what I'm going to base that off. Anyway, um, let's talk some recruiting, won't we? That sounds fun. So Florida State had a pretty solid pretty solid week in recruiting there. They are now up to fourth in the 247 Sports team composite rankings, just behind uh, the Gators and Ohio State, and way behind Ohio or behind Georgia. But nobody's catching Georgia this year. Florida State adds Armando Blunt from Miami Central. This is a kid I'm pretty high on, right? He was a 2025 kid 
uh, who just reclassed to 2024. He got his new ranking uh, in the 2024 class. He was a five-star in the 25 class. Obviously, uh, with the history of players who reclass and the uncertainty around, around the guy, it's hard to keep a five-star when you don't have as much data on him. 24-7 sports still, to show how much they love this kid, kept him in the top 40 nationally as a reclassed prospect. That's a nice win. That's a player who uh, I think FSU really thought they were going to get. Then he committed to, to Miami. The Rock tweets about him, and the Knowles are able to flip him. The games got played. I do think that results on the field matter, uh, both in terms of how much playing time some of these young guys are getting. The development there of Pat Payton, I think, helps you in this. And Florida State's just uh, kind of holistic approach. Obviously, Norvell has to be one of your better recruiters, I think, on on uh, on some of these. I've seen Blunt, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple times in person. I I find this guy to be incredibly coachable. I know that the staff at the Under Armour camp down there in Miami that we went to back in in like February or March, whenever that was, was really impressed. Just he got it. He got it quickly. He understood what they wanted him to do. He's a really quality athlete, good body control guy. And I I think of him as like an incredibly high floor prospect and a player who I think has a chance to help you play early. You know, I mean, he's a dude who I think, if he's not done growing, could end up being like, you know, maybe 6'4". Maybe he gets like 6'4 and a quarter. Who knows? Maybe, maybe get another inch out of him. I think he's a guy who's going to play you know, maybe at that 270 range. I think he's a dude who can play with some power in the rush, a guy that understands how to bend and play with leverage, and somebody who I think is going to win in the pass rush game with his hands to defeat blocks, right? Go watch the Bama strip sack against Tennessee this weekend. 41 comes around the edge, and that, that, little, that little chop move he does is, is really impressive. Blunt cares about details. It just, I don't know, man. You do this for a long time. You you pick up on things. And some of these guys go through the drills, but they're not listening. Blunt was going through the drills and trying to really understand what the purpose of each drill was. He was first in line every single time. Sprinting back to the back, you know, makes sense. Um it's it's impressive. I, I think this is a an important get for them. Recruiting is also a zero sum game. So you are taking one from Miami. That's important. Mario Cristobal talks about how that's a line of scrimmage program. And I think it is. And you guys, if you watched cover three, you know my thoughts on Miami's recruiting, right? Like I have no doubt that Cristobal is going to recruit well. I don't think any head coach in, in the sport puts in more effort or demands more of his staff in recruiting than Mario does. And that's both a good and a bad thing. Like you grind on your guys, but also like he, he demands more of himself, I think, as a recruiter. Anybody I've ever heard about, just from the, the behind the scenes stuff you hear. But if it's a lot, if it's a lot line of scrimmage game, you know, Miami has One player who's four or five star in their class right now, who's more than 250 pounds. Now, last year, Miami did a great job, and they have beaten you repeatedly in recent years. Nigel Lee Kelly comes to mind, right? They killed it on the offensive line. I said after signing day, like, you need to start worried about Miami a little bit because they have a real chance to just physically beat you up on line scrimmage with the way they're recruiting. This is a big one for FSU because you. We'll talk about it in a minute, but they had some losses this week too. Are you building a team or are you building a program? Understand what you can get out of the portal likely and understand what you can't. Ask Ohio State what it's like to have to go to the portal for linemen, right? Did you watch that on Saturday? They didn't exactly hit in the transfer portal at offensive tackle. It's hard to find you know, big-time stuff in the portal all the time. You need to understand 
that you've been both good and lucky in the portal so far. And you need to have an honest conversation with yourself. And I think they do inside that building uh, about how sustainable and repeatable that is. In some ways, it's very sustainable because you now have a great product to sell track record wise. Hey, come here as a transfer. We don't play favorites. We're going to give you an equal opportunity, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you also have a chance to flip Artavis Jones, which would mean that the Canes would then have zero players over 250 who are rated four or five stars. Those are the guys I really care about. You know, the really big time, not that Artavis Jones is like crazy big time, but like he's, you know, a, he's a, a defensive lineman that you'd rather have in your class than not. Um, because that's, he has the upside to potentially develop into something. And if if he does develop that type of player, it's very hard to find in the portal, right? You you have to keep trying to stack talented bodies in this thing because again, are you building a team? Or are you building a program? I, I think that's the question. You know, um, I, I think that's a question you have, you have to think about, and I, I think that you know that that's the question Mike has to ask himself. Right, they're but they're not up to number four in the country. Like that's what you want to see. That is the like that's the progression that you want. Uh, uh, Kesna asks, "Do you still feel Miami has a higher ceiling on their talent at the critical transpositions on both sides of the line?" Absolutely, yes. You have to get more of these guys. They out recruited you badly on line of scrimmage last two years. They like going forward, they have the potential. Like, if you're projecting it out, yes, Miami's going to be better than you on the lines of scrimmage just based on what they brought in, in high school. Now, you have to keep stemming the tide. You have to, you have to flip this thing. You have to turn these wins on the field into wins off the field. I think Blunt is a is a pretty good sign of that. You need more of it. Gotta have more of it. Um, so all right. Let's uh, let's talk about a few more. Jamari Howard's a kid we've talked about quite a bit. I think FSU is in a good position for the former Michigan State commit at corner. That would give you a lot of speed and a lot of length in this class at corner. So you already have Charles Lester, who I know has at times struggled this year on the field, but he still potential-wise has a lot of it, okay? Like that's – Pat Sertan is still going to be really excited to have this guy when he gets on campus to, to coach him up. K.J. Bolden is a player who I think actually could be a really damn good corner for you if, if that's where he wanted to play. And you get Jamari Howard. I am extremely bullish on where FSU is going with its secondary. Look at who they got last year. Look at the early returns on these guys. They're already playing for you, and in some cases playing like meaningful minutes for you. Or not minutes, it's not basketball, snaps. That's encouraging, right? Um, I like where this team is going. I mean, you're like one of the questions you have about Norvell and his staff are the ability to win some of these high level recruiting battles. Obviously, I think just look, look at the national recognition they get. Like FSU's NIL is really good. I think they were ahead of the curve on that in many ways. Um, I mean, fourth in the country is really good. You're you're going to finish top ten for sure. You have a you definitely have a shot to finish top five. Uh, there's some shot you finish top three actually, and I, I really think it, it is it is possible. Certain positions you have to recruit better. I think most of those positions are on defense, and you had a loss this week in L.J. McCray, who is you know top five player nationally. Defensive lineman out of, out of uh, Daytona. Absolute stud. A guy that we, were, we we watched in camps was like, oh my God, this guy is freaky with that size and athleticism. But he had not really turned that on into as much on-field production as a junior. As a senior, and we really do value senior production too. Like I think it matters a whole lot because you want to see that progression. The best guys generally go out with a bang. They dominate that senior year because they're just that much physically better than everybody else. 
If you're not dominating as a senior, to me, it's a major red flag. And McCray did. Like, McCray smoked some quite good players, guys, this year. He's a real deal guy, and it's going to be a pain in the ass to play against him if you're a Noel, because he, you know, he, 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 he picked Florida. I do think that Norvell, if he's going to get FSU to where it wants to go, to where he wants it to go, has to demand more from his staff in recruiting. Now, that's up to him to decide whether that means more effort or more talent. You guys catch my drift? Mike needs more from his defensive recruiting staff. I don't know if it's more effort or if it's more recruiting talent. I don't mean like bringing in better players recruiting talent. I mean like more talented recruiters. I, I That's basically what I'm, what I'm going to say on that. You guys can, can read into that as much as you want. They need more guys that they can be confident if they put on a recruitment can get it done. To where you know your your aces on the staff don't have to come in, you know, to with the baseball playoffs going on. It's it's sort of this thing where yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have your studs, your aces you expect to go, you know, seven, eight innings, hopefully. But you need your other guys not not to throw up all their, over, over themselves. And and you know give up five runs through two and have to pull them, and then have to have the bullpen come in to try to save because it's all hands on deck. In these games, can can you give me five or six innings of, of like three or four run ball? I don't know that they have that right now, and they need better. And I brought up the fact that you were about to play five consecutive injured or backup quarterbacks. The defensive numbers are going to look really good, guys. They are. Is that going to mask stuff? I, I don't know. Uh, but it uh, it's it's a really poor job not to get LJ McCray on campus over the summer. Like that's a, that's a failure by the by the staff. Just is. You had to get one of Blunt and McCray. Things are moving in the right direction, overall. But you have to recruit the front seven better than you are right now if you want to win a national title you just do those teams have a lot of game wreckers the teams that that lift that trophy at the end of the year they have game wreckers more than one you, you need more of those but you are moving in the right direction it, it's like i'm not this is not a criticism i'm just saying How many of those guys in the defensive staff do you really trust can go get it done for you? I don't know. That's that's up for Mike Norvell to decide. But it is clear to me that that he will have to make a decision there. Uh, and his, his evaluation on that is probably going to be better than mine is because he works for those guys every single day in that office. So are you demanding more effort or are you de demanding better recruiters? I don't know. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, FSU has a really good shot to finish top five, some shot to finish top three. Uh, do I think FSU can land Zay Mency? Yeah. Pretty talented safety. I I, I do. I, I think there's there's some chance at it. You know, blue chip ratio wise, you're still looking really good. Uh, Elijah Moore got bumped up to four-star status. Luane McCoy, 24-7 sports remains high on him. Uh, had some people ask about Jason Zandamella the really talented center uh, from Clearwater who's committed to USC. USC is having a, a bit of a, a, a down year this year. Uh, they already have two losses, but, uh, you know, they don't look very good. They look unserious. Lincoln Riley skipped his uh, his press, like, little coach's show last night. Said he was under the weather. Maybe he was. Uh, they didn't make any players available last, or <laughs> last Saturday night. After they lost, it, they see, just seem to be a, a bit unserious. Um, 
yeah, I look, do I do I think that they will land Zay Mincy? I, I don't know. Um thoughts on Koi Perch. Uh not Perch, excuse me. Koi Perch. This kid's got some juice. He's from Minnesota. FSU offered him recently. He got a huge bump in the 24-7 sports uh rankings and just watch him. Like multi-sport kid, elite athlete, listed as a safety. I think he could probably play be one of those true super valuable nickel backers that you can leave on the field. It allows you to play quote unquote lighter personnel, but he actually plays. He can stop the run like a linebacker. He's committed to Minnesota right now. Why not offer him? Like why, why not take a swing? Right. Who knows? Uh, you, you pulled Jermaine Johnson who you didn't pull him from Minnesota, but he was from Minnesota. So I guess we'll see. Uh, he's, yeah, I, I think he's he's a stud. That's that's a guy that you'd like to get your hands on. And look, think about where this program has come from that we're talking about a class that's sitting number four in the country. A class that is doing a better job of keeping talent in state. And yet we're still talking about how much better they could get. I think that uh, speaks to how good some of the things you have you have cooking right now are. This is this is some good stuff, and I'm I'm, um, I'm mostly impressed, and yet, like, I feel like we always try to be honest with you guys. There are areas on this staff where they can and probably have to improve. So, and how good your co-host is? Yeah, well, I mean, right. That's part of it. Um, uh, Adam Brown says, have you seen, have you seen Jones's that, that's uh, our Tavis Jones senior tape? Uh, he said, uh, have heard it's poor. Uh, look, I, I don't think he's an early impact guy. I think he's a guy that you need, you need to get in and, and develop. Right. Uh, would Danas be a good get for us? Yeah. I, I, again, you need to stack these bodies who have a real chance to play, right? You, you, you see a kid, you see some skills that, that, that he d demonstrates that he owns. And you see, okay, can you develop him into that? It's a numbers game. There are very few guys where it's like, there's no doubt he's going to be a hit. You have to stack a lot of the big bodies who have a chance to be really damn good so that you don't have to rely on the portal because I have like max confidence, max confidence that FSU can get guys from the portal, but the guys have to actually be in the portal. Does that make sense? Sometimes the portal crop is just not, just not good. This year at offensive tackle, if you really needed the good one, you were kind of screwed. This year at linebacker in the portal, it actually was not all that great. Safety uh, was not particularly uh, good. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll watch how these teams do down the stretch that you're competing against. Uh, I think FSU has a pretty nice shot. Maybe to get a couple more flips. We're at an hour and 11. So I appreciate everybody watching. And uh, this has been a whole lot of fun. Florida State's an undefeated team with a top five recruiting class. Very personable head coach. Getting a whole lot of media love right now. It's hard to beat, man. Hard to beat. You guys have a good one.